that the Lord has had given me many, many years ago now, but revisited me. And, and I know we've heard, I, you've, I guarantee you've heard this message before, but that's okay. Because the Lord gave it to me in a fresh way. And the Lord had, had given me a dream. And I'll share that with you in a moment. Only a few people have actually heard that dream. But 1 Samuel chapter 15 beginning in verse 21. But the people took the spoil. Sheep and oxen. The chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. To sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Samuel said, Hath the Lord has a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. My mother used to quote that to me with a switch in her hand. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as an iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed and committed and uh, transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned about to go away. And he laid hold unto his skirt of his mantle. And it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day. And hath given it unto a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Many of, us, many of us have heard this portion of Scripture preached multiple ways. God gave a commandment at the beginning of this chapter to eliminate the Amalekites. And many see this as wrathful and, and hateful of God to do. But the Amalekites had plagued and tortured God's people for years. And God sends the command. He says, Samuel, you go to the king which I have anointed. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and 1 Samuel chapter 10 that Saul was chosen king of Israel, anointed by God through Samuel to the work of his people, to help work with his people. And it was one simple command. He said, I, I want it all to be destroyed. As harsh as it may sound, I want it all out of the way. And Saul decides that his own discretion, his own wisdom is far above God's wisdom and God's word. And it makes more sense to do what he thinks is right than what God says is right. And I, I'm just going to share my heart with you tonight. And, and I, I, I know it seems like sometimes I, I don't want to be the one that challenges and things like that. I, but I, I'm going to just share briefly. Pastor, get ready to come in back, back clean up, all right? Gave me a thumbs up, okay. But no, I, I just want to share my heart with you tonight because God gave a commandment and He said, listen, all I need you to do is obey. And we talked Wednesday night, last Wednesday night, about how Jonah had a decision. He had a choice to make. He could either respond to the call of God in fear 
or he could run after the call of God and do what God was calling him to do. And we dissected that portion of Scripture and, and how he fled and he went the other way. And, and we talked about running from the call of God on your life. And, and, and last, last Sunday night, this past Sunday night, we talked about... Uh, about uh, being transformed and, and we can't have a transformed mind without a laid down life. Can you say amen? We can't have verse 2 of Romans chapter uh, 12 without Romans, uh, without Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 that says lay your life down, a living sacrifice. And then you can have the transformed mind and know the perfect will of God. And we talked about these things and this is similar to laying down your life. You see, God has given us a command. He, get, he even said in Jonah chapter 1 to Jonah, He said, I, the word of the Lord came to him. God had given him a word. God had given Saul a word in this portion of Scripture. And he says, listen, all I need is obedience. That's all I need is for you to do what I'm asking you to do. But Saul, again, as I said earlier, sought his own counsel, thought his own way was, was better. You see... What I find fascinating about this portion of Scripture is, is when we dig into it and we see that, that the Bible says that, listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. This day God has tore the kingdom of Israel away from you. You see, He was still, by man's standards, a king. He didn't walk out, Samuel didn't walk out with his crown. Say, he, today, right now, you're no longer king. But he's saying spiritually... The presence of God that was on you the day that I anointed you has left you. And you see, that's so powerful because in relating it to today's times, we have a church that still has a crown and still has a symbol of, of authority. And we say we have authority, but yet it seems that the Spirit of God has departed from many churches in America. We're anointed. We're still anointed king. And it all looks good and we have pretty things and we're all blessed and we're thankful for those things. Very thankful for those things. But yet, the Spirit of God had left Saul and he was powerless. This is a man that the Bible says in, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 10 that when he was anointed king, he prophesied. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he prophesied with other prophets. And declared the words of the Lord. and I mean, he just had... Uh, he, he, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And, and he did all these great things. But, but here he is a king by man's standards. He's supposed to have power and authority. But in the Spirit, he was powerless. He was anointed, but powerless. All because of disobedience. I, and, and listen, I, I, I'm not... I'm not I don't know your life. I'm not trying to meddle in your business. But even, even Pastor Jade Abrams, there's, there's more things in my life that I need to lay down. There's always deeper depths to God. I say it all the time. Smith Wigglesworth said you should be satisfied in the fact that you'll never be satisfied in God. He's too deep. He's too vast. And you see, God... Wants a powerful, glorious bride to come back to. He wants that first church. He wants that, that church that says, listen, God, wherever you call us, we will go. I know this sounds like a record, but I'm just delivering my heart to you. And, and, and I, I want to bring it, bring it together with some things that the Lord has been dealing with me on. And, and I just want to, to share my heart with you. But, but what, what's happening is we have this beautiful Powerful, so to speak. The evangelicals, they talk all the time on the news about the evangelical vote and how, how we were the ones that put Donald Trump into office. And they talk about all these things. So, so, so people see us as powerful because we're a large number of people in the United States. But, let, but yet in the Spirit, it seems like we're powerless. And what cost Saul the power and the Spirit of God? disobedience and he allowed things to live that needed to die the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 13 we've said it Sunday night do mortify mort kill the deeds of the flesh that's why Jesus would say listen pick up your cross daily 
And follow me in Luke 9 and 23. We have to daily put ourselves on that cross. And say, God, whatever it is, I lay my life down. I want to transform mind. I want freedom. There's a, there's a world out there that needs to see a church running after the things of God. Running after the things of God. Willing to do the things of God. We need a church that's anointed and powerful, not anointed and powerless. Called, but they don't know who they are. Called, but they would rather listen to their own counsel than God's counsel. Rather talk to someone else than to spend time talking to the Lord about the problems and situations and decisions we have to make. But the Lord spoke to me in a dream, and this was many months ago, and I've only shared this with a select few people. I was sharing it with someone, a group of people last, last weekend. And I, I, my, my wife's a dreamer. My mother-in-law's a dreamer. Michaela dreams. I, but I have weird dreams. You know, I, have the, you know, I, had, I, had, I had a dream that we, I went skydiving. I, I jumped out of the plane. Boom, rapture happens. I'm the first one to heaven. I'm waiting for everybody else to get there. Had a dream like that. Dead serious. Okay, it's not very spiritual. Okay? But there are times that I've, I, the Lord will give me dreams and it just will sink in. And, and this was one of those moments. And, and I remember, and Sierra will remember it well because I scared her to death. Because I woke up out of my sleep and some will wake up speaking in the Spirit and some will, will wake up and just all of a sudden like. But I woke up saying one phrase. I woke up just saying, this snake is alive because you refuse to let it die. You say, what What does that mean? And in my dream, I had a dream that that there was many men of God and I had the opportunity to be a part of that. And and we were in this this, this just kind of hole looking thing. And and I, I recognized some pastors and evangelists that I had seen before. And we fought these beasts. And there was this massive beast. And we fought this snake, this huge snake. Like 30, 40 foot long. We, we fought these things and we killed them. But, but some, of the, some of the men decided that we should build a shrine. And enshrine this snake as, as a symbol of our victory. I'm not going to go into every detail, but more or less they, they built this shrine. They put this, this glass case around this snake and they built a two-story building around this snake. And there was a huge youth activity and, and there, was, there was youth all over the place in this massive gymnasium. And, and, and there's young adults all over. There's a few adults that I could see, but the vast majority were teenagers and, and they were running around rampant. They weren't listening to anyone. And I look down into the, to the crowd and I see Sierra and she's just lifting up her arms and she's shaking her head and, 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 and she's just like, I don't know what's going on. I, it's like chaos. And I heard a sound and I go back into this lobby looking area and this snake has broken the glass. And its head is sticking out. In my dream, I grab this snake and I sh- I'm just fighting with it. I grab it and I, I get control of it. I'm starting to strangle it. I see it struggling and I take it to that gymnasium. And I, 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 don't, I don't know every definition of what this means, but I just want to show you this, this, is, this is real to me. I don't just talk about these things. This is something I live. It's not a light switch. I, I turn on and off. I threw that snake over that balcony in that gymnasium and everyone stopped. And I said, this snake is alive. Because you refuse to let it die. I've preached multiple messages. What can we not let go of? What can Jade Abrams not let go of? I know I'm not screaming and hollering. I don't have four points or three points. And this may mean nothing to you. But church, we have a choice to make. We have a choice to make. And as a 
a member of the body of Christ. Pastor, I'm going to be honest, I am so tired of seeing people. We talk about it. We, we talk about it, but I, I don't think it really sinks into us. But I'm so tired of seeing people walk out of here not set free. I'm so tired of people thinking they're free, but going right back to the things that once held them bound. I'm tired. I'm tired of seeing a church that has the looks and and the appearance of of king and goodliness and anointing and power, but yet we're powerless in prayer. We're powerless. I want to see healing. I want to see deliverance. But what will I not let go of? Do I need to get a dumb phone instead of a smartphone? I know people that's done that. Jay, now that's extreme. Listen, if you want to see supernatural and extreme things and God do extreme things, it's going to take extreme sacrifice. What can we not let go of? What can we not kill? What what deeds of our flesh are we keeping alive? And God's saying... Listen, I I want all of this gone. I I love you. I want to be here for you. I I want to move in your life. I I want, I have anointed you. I've called you. Saul was called. He was anointed. He had a purpose. God was like, "I, I want you to be over my people. I want you to lead them. I want you to guide them into a deeper relationship with me. But they can't go forward because you can't let things go. Because I can't let things go. What's alive in my life, Lord, that I'm refusing to let die? What am I refusing to let go of? Church, we have a choice to make. We all have a choice to make. What we're dealing with, our trials, our tribulations, are we going to let, are we, we have a choice to, to let them affect us, or we have a choice to say, God, I'm giving it to you and I'm going on with you just the same. I'm getting closer to you. We have a choice to be free and free indeed through Jesus, or we can pick up the same bondage and go right back out the door and go to the same things and wonder why God's not moving. We have a choice to make. Paul had a choice to make. Could he let his past haunt him? Which it did, but he said, no. The Lord spoke to him and said, listen, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. That's all behind you. It's all behind you, Paul. What do we let stay alive? To be anointed... You know, a definition to anoint someone is is like a king naming a successor. He says, listen, your power is now my power. The Bible tells us that we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of us. But yet, myself included, I live down here. When he's called me to live up here. The same power. Peter could walk down the streets and his shadow could heal people. Because he lived a surrendered life. What makes a soldier so great? Why do we respect those in armed forces so greatly? Why do we hold them in such high regard and with such great esteem? Is because they're willing to surrender it all. They're willing to lay their very life down on the line for people they will never meet, never shake hands with, never hear their cheers or applause. What can we not let go of? If we want God to to move and and, and be powerful through us and use us the way that He wants to, I I, I think of, of God just sitting on His throne saying, Oh, if you only knew the plans I have for you. It's not that God is limited, but that we've limited God. What's alive? 
that we refuse to let die. Church, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, He says, listen, I, I've given you the power. I've given you the power to tread on serpents. I've given you power to heal the sick. I've given you power. Yet we're powerless. Now listen, I, I've felt power in this place, in this house. And I say it all the time, and I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I feel like I'm a broken record, and, and, and I, I, I just apologize for that. But I, I, I want to tell you that it's not something, that power, that anointing, that, that presence of God, that Spirit of God is not something that I want to come and go. I want it to stay. But Samuel, the man of God, walked in to Saul. He says, man, all this stuff's alive. What's going on, Saul? There's no room for anything else. No room for obedience. There's no room for more of God because you've got so much stuff. The cry of church leaders today, and pastor can attest to this, for some reason, it faded out. But I'm seeing all these ministers, they have massive ministries, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. But I saw a minister the other day say, listen, I'm sorry. Because I've forgotten souls. The, soul, the only purpose for our existence is to win souls. And he said, I allowed so many other things. I preached so many other things. He said, I forgot souls. Church, if you read in the book of Acts, the power of God fell simply where Jesus was preached. Nothing fancy, nothing profound. I preached Jesus. And the gospel and the kingdom. And people were filled with the Holy Spirit. People were healed. Set free. We've allowed all this other stuff. Pastor, if you'll come this evening. Church, we have a decision to make. Each and every one of us. I can't make it for you. I, I know I sound... So repetitive. I, but the ordinary's got to go. What we think's logical, what makes sense, it's got to go. It made sense. Paul, Saul saying, listen, I, I, these, these animals were for sacrifice. I had good intentions. And Samuel shows up, but your intentions weren't God's intentions. Your plans weren't God's plans. The word of the Lord came to you, Saul. And today... He's ripping the kingdom from your hand. Listen, Jesus has a kingdom. Jesus has a kingdom. And He came proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And we've allowed the enemy just to take and take and take. Because we refuse to let God take and take and take in our life. We want to see the power of God on display. We want to see God do supernatural things. 
Some things just have to go. Preached the message many times. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. Sanctify yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. God wants to do wonders. But He says, sanctify, let things go. Because I want to take you to a place where you can see wonders. What's alive that shouldn't be? And what's dead in us that should be alive? You say, oh, that's negative, that's negative. Oh, Pastor Jay, that's negative. It sounds negative to our physical ears. But in the spiritual, a fleshly death, dying to ourselves, means that God can do supernatural, extraordinary, amazing things. The day of Pentecost, and I'm I'm done. I'm going to ask Pastor to come. The day of Pentecost, a reason we, 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 we talk about it all the time. They saw miraculous things, but the Bible says they were filled. You know what that word means in the Greek, Brother Larry? It means full. Nothing profound. They were full, but to be full, you must first be emptied. To be full, we must first be emptied. Emptied of self, desires. Listen, there, I, I, I'll be completely honest. There, there is, there is a, a, a movie I would love to see. In high school, all through high school, college, seen all the, the, the precursors, all the movies before it, I would love to go see. But I'll tell you, in prayer, calling out to God, Brother Larry, the Spirit of God, check me. And again, you're looking at me like nuts. The Spirit of God, check me. I said, would that glorify my name? If someone saw you sitting there, would that glorify my name? Would I be lifted up in that moment? Church, I want to be emptied. I want want to make all the room in the world so He can just pour in and pour in and pour in. So my cup will not only be full, but it will overrun. The day of Pentecost, I believe that's what it was. They were filled, but they were filled so much that it overran because they got out of that room. And everyone saw. Everyone saw what God had done. Pastor, would you come? Thank you, Pastor Jay. We are in a place in history that is very unique. It is a time of great opportunity as well as a time of great challenge. And tonight, while it may be a solemn assembly in this house, please hear the word of the Lord. We today have the ability to bring in a a fresh presence of the Holy Spirit, but it will cost us like it cost every generation before us and as I said in recent days it will not cost you something but it will cost you everything and today we have become a society uh, that has become so self-absorbent in the world but unfortunately that's transitioned within the walls of the church as well and one of the greatest issues that I see today taking place in our world uh, is the fact that we fail to understand just what season we really live in. And Paul, who gave us two-thirds of the New Testament Scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, 
as he was writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, if you read those first five verses, and I was reflecting on this this afternoon. Uh, let me give them to you very quickly, and then we're going to pray in just a moment. But it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, times of trouble. Uh, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, uh, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. But then it says this, from such turn away. And one of the most disturbing things that I do see today across uh, this nation as well as other places on the globe is that we are fulfilling Second Timothy chapter number 3, uh, 1 through 5 and still desiring an outpouring of the presence of God in our lives. It can't happen. Uh, I find that, uh, and I've seen it in this house as well as many other houses. Uh, we was in camp meeting last week and... Uh, I see that God has been robbed of his worth, even in the house of the Lord. We come to the house of God and we're so preoccupied with stuff uh, that no longer do we even lift our voice a little along our hands and worship. Uh, but something spoke to my heart uh, in camp meeting the other day. I have a, a young man, I call him my friend because I've been able to be with him over the last couple of years at different times in meeting there in Kentucky. And uh, I was drawn to this young boy. And last year while I was preaching their camp meeting in October, I, I remember by the unction of the Holy Spirit that I pulled this young boy out and I prayed specifically for him. And there's a call on his life. There's a mandate on his life. He was 13, year old, 13 years old at the time. He's 14 years old now. But just a few weeks ago, him and his friend, uh, who was 12 years old, they was in, on a gator on an ATV vehicle, and they had a massive accident, and they lifelined him to the hospital. Uh, he has went through multiple surgeries, uh, and it was very, very dangerous. And, uh, and they've had to take skin from other parts of his body, and he broke both of his legs. He's still not been able to walk, but he's in a wheelchair. And at 14 years of age, just a couple of days after it happened, uh, he said, well, maybe the Lord has allowed this to happen so my friend can see Jesus do something wonderful. But when I was at camp meeting last week, he was there, and they wheel him in to, uh, and he, they shake him out of a, a one wheelchair, put him in a little powered wheel, uh, wheelchair where he can move around, and, and he's got this radiant smile, and he's full of life and energy. He, he's not down in a place where he's just miserable, but in the midst of everything that's going wrong in his life, he has a smile, he's full of energy, he has a passion for the things of God, and then part of his youth group that they do uh, the dramas and things like we do at times and they come get ready to do a drama and and Dylan comes wheeling up there in his wheelchair and they get him in the in the center of the congregation and they began to do their their worship and this 14 year old boy that has had his life nearly stuffed away from him sitting in a wheelchair begins to do his drama and they bring a little bass drum and sit beside him, and he's kind of the center of this thing. He's, I remember him doing this drama when he was there before, but he did not allow anything to steal his worship. And in the midst of his stricken state, in the midst of his overwhelmingness and, and challenges, he, I watched a 14-year-old boy begin to worship the Lord with his eyes closed, with his hands raised, and he wasn't concerned about anything or what was going on around him, but he was simply giving God praise and adoration because he knows in his heart who God really is. And I believe that's one of the things today in our culture is that we have allowed the enemy to bring so much noise and so much distraction and has clouded our lives that we have lost the vision of who God really is in our lives. And, and, and I, I want you to understand with me today, if we're ever going to get back to where the anointing and the power of God is present in the house of the Lord in America like God is desiring it for it to be, it will be because His people began to worship Him in spirit and and in truth again. 
where we don't need a life coach or someone else coaching us, telling us what to do and how to do and when to do. But we're going to have to come back to a place where we return to our first love and we began to be men and women that have a heart after God again and began to give him the praise and the adoration. Everybody's in our culture today is this, and I'm not against this, and I believe that it's important. Everybody says, well, I, I, I want a fresh word. I, I want God to speak, in, and, and we need a fresh word. We need fresh manna, but, but we, want, we want another prophetic utterance, or we want, we want the word to speak in a different manner to us, and, and there is a time and a place for that, and we need that, but how many knows that when we come to the house of God, uh, our worship is not for us, but it is for Him? And, and the Bible teaches us that he inhabits the praise of his people, meaning that's where he dwells, that's where he lives. And, and then we wonder in the American church today, why is it that we don't really see the glory or experience the power of God? Listen, he doesn't dwell where he is not glorified and lifted up. But if we're not careful, we glorify all of the negative things instead of the one thing that should be glorified, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucifying. I was in meetings today for a little while concerning the unreached people groups and, and the missions and things of that nature. And I, and I was set with an 87-year-old man that has given him his life to short-term missions and other things across this nation and the nations of the world. And, and I saw an 87-year-old 87, 87 man that physically is not able to travel and work like he always has. Uh, but I seen that there was a heart full of passion and desire. And, and, and he's like, I, I, I got to be part of what you're doing doing how can I do that and and we had an hour and a half conversation and I saw this 87 year old man that has got all kinds of, of issues physically but yet there's a spirit that is still rising up and I said God if we could capture that and bring that back to the house of God listen uh, with the, the essence of it is this there is a place that we must return and that place that we have to return, while it may not be uh, popular, it may not be something that's celebrated by the mainstream church, uh, but, but I'm going to tell you there is a place that we must go, and that is Jeremiah 6 and 16. And it is simply this, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the way, and see, and ask for the old path, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Why is there such restlessness? Why is there such void today in the American church? Why is it that people are so scattered? It's because they're not in a place of rest, because their soul is troubled, because they're walking outside of the covering or the mandate of God. Listen, Scripture has not changed. We still are a set-apart people. We are still a peculiar people. We are still a people that must walk in holiness, and we are a people that is required to be different than the world. And the question today is, are we willing to do that? The word of the Lord in Jeremiah 18 simply says this. When I decide to do something concerning a nation, he said, there, there, there's nothing that can, that can change it unless they come to a place of repentance. We today in America and the Western Hemisphere has an opportunity to usher in a, an awakening and a revival. But it's going to take more than a song. It's going to take more than a shout. It's going to take more than emotions. It's going to take men and women that's willing to lay themselves on the altar and say, God... Purge me, cleanse me, and make me into what you would have me to be. And that's my prayer for my life. That's my prayer for your life. That's my prayer for this house and the houses of worship across this land. Because what we need today, I need some 14-year-old Dylans that will simply say, no matter what state I'm in, I'm going to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. Because it is then that he inhabits the house and the glory of the Lord begins to fall. This evening on a Wednesday evening, I know that you desire to have an experience and an in, and a depth encounter with God or you would not be here on a Wednesday evening. With everything else that's going on in our world, you had plenty of things to do, but you chose to be in the house of the Lord. So tonight I say this, if we're this committed, let's just surrender everything else and remove everything else that doesn't need to be there and let's be the ones that step in and bring about a move of God in the hour in which we live. It is simply this. When we desire the things that his heart is desiring, we begin to experience something very unique and special. I must remind you, and we're, and we're going to close with this. Just a little over 100 years ago, William Seymour, on one end of the, on the, on the nation, 
Another gentleman on the other end of the nation at the same time began to make a proclamation that in about a hundred years from now, there will be a move of God that makes everything that we see seem like nothing. It's been just a little over a hundred years since Azusa Street, and those men of God make that pro proclamation. And I will tell you that the world today is much like it was then. People was more in love with religion than they was with relationship. Is more concerned about what they could do for themselves instead of what they could do for the kingdom. We'd become distracted. But then in the midst of all of the stuff, people began to call out to God and God was faithful to hear them. And I'm reminded tonight in 2 Peter chapter 3, we often hear people reference verse number 9 where it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but He's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a place of repentance. But if you read down a little further in that chapter, verse number 14 and 15, it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace, without spot and blameless, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. The Lord has delayed his coming and his long suffering needs to be interpreted as this it is a hand of salvation that's extended to this generation. But we are the vehicle that he's using. And the question today must be asked, are we willing to be used for the advancing of the kingdom? Are we willing to go where others have never been? As we stand all over the house tonight, I want us to pray together. And I want us just to pray corporately together tonight. You can stand where you are, and you can stand or kneel at this altar, but we're going to pray corporately together. Tonight, we can continue to do what we've always done and continue to experience the same results, or we can get serious about the things of God, and we can become world changers. This ideal that we have tomorrow or we have next week or we have next month, that's not, that's not true today. I can tell you tonight that most of the people that I go remove from a home or a hospital bed or a rehab center bed, they're not 80 years old, 90 years old, but most of them are in their 50s, early 60s many in their mid-40s. They thought, too, that they could do it next week or next month or next year. I dealt with a family today that tears running down their face and his brother had helped me remove his brother from the home and tears come down his face and he said, I lost another brother, I lost another sister, now I've lost this brother, and said he just now retired, just getting ready to rest. What I'm saying today is this, we have no promise of tomorrow. If we're going to do something, we have to do it today. Because today is the day of salvation. And I don't want to be found squandering, not been a good steward with my time, but I want to take advantage of every moment that God has given me in the now. And I pray that's you as well. But today, somebody's got to go. Somebody's got to speak. Somebody's got to love. Somebody's got to be the example. The question is, will that somebody be you? Will it be me?